Welcome to Colonia Cast episode 12. We've got a really exciting episode lined up for you. I'm just going to get our, our pleasantries out of the way here real quick. Um, thank you to the Turtle Room uh, for, for sponsoring this show. Uh, and uh, they, they've been really generous with us, giving us some kind of startup resources for this uh, and, and really sort of believing in, in, in us to take this and make this something cool. So uh, thank, thanks to the people over there. You can, you can visit them at theturtleroom.org uh, and find everything there. So today, uh, and we're also working on some other partnerships that we should be announcing soon uh, and making our student uh, Colonia Cast Fund. So that, that's something to look forward to. So today we're going to be talking about a really interesting group of turtles. I think for lack of a better term, the, I guess, subfamily Kellenay is kind of the topic of, of today. Uh, we've got Stefan Etmar from Austria on. Uh, Stefan is uh, kind of the authority on these at this point. He wrote the book on, on <laughs> Misoclamis, the toad-headed turtles. Um, he's also a member of the IUCN Tortoise and Freshwater Turtle Specialist Group. Uh, and conducted his master's work on the kind of home range of twist neck turtles and total chelid diversity within French Guiana. Uh, he's done an incredible amount of things, uh, a really extensive resume, and, and we're really excited to, to talk uh, to Stefan today and, and learn some stuff about this, I think, pretty underrepresented uh, and, and not frequently talked about group of, of turtles. So thanks for coming on, Stefan. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming on. All right, do we want to get into the questions or? Let's go, yeah. All right, so we always we always start them off this way. It's a bit of a cliche question, but why turtles? Like, what got you interested in turtles? Well, um, I'm a 90s kid, so of course I have to tell the story about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles being my favorite cartoon on, on TV, and, and therefore I like turtles. But, well, um, yeah, it's, it's maybe part of this, but actually um, my family was always very interested in animals, and um, my, my grandfather used to take me to, like, uh, fish trade shows and um, our... For a while, our neighbor had his own um, fish room where I would spend some time and, and also, um, yeah, get some first experience with aquariums, fish keeping and stuff. And um, when I was like 10 or 12 years old, um, one, of my, yeah, one of my best friends, he got a little aquarium with uh, radiard sliders. And I said, Mom, I want that too. I already had an aquarium at that point, but... Uh, I, we never thought about getting a turtle in there. And yeah, then that was the point when I got the first two radiard sliders in there. And from then on, yeah, the number only grew of, of turtles in, in my aquariums and in my home. Yeah, So that that was the start. That's actually really interesting. I, I like how every one of these origin stories of everybody we have on the podcast involves a radiard slider. Like it brings into questions like what if like the trade with radiard sliders really helped spark so many people's interests in it because i mean i had radiard sliders when i was younger and i think most, several other people on here have had them at some point yeah yeah you know nowadays they are of course radiard sliders can't be imported into the european union anymore but um generally small turtles have been a staple in in the pet shop um offer whatever they had on, on live animals uh, for for decades now and uh yeah i mean of course it created huge ecological problems um also animal welfare problems but of, yeah just like you said many people started like that and then they became educators or also scientists or um conservationists for that reason so yeah it's not all that bad but of course yeah, I, I guess the downside kind of is, is is way worse than than the good things. But yeah, I mean, maybe with better suited colonians for pet keeping, we still would be able to recruit um, turtle nerds like us and and not harm the environment that much. But yeah, that's just an assumption. Yeah. Well, I think that. As a gateway animal, it, you know it, it's po it has positive impacts, and I think sometimes 
ecologically, you have to take it on a case by case basis in terms of their impacts. But there's certainly certain things like down here. I do kind of research on the western pond turtles, the southwestern pond turtles here, and I've I spent a months kind of surveying out there, and and we use some. I guess statistical tests to look at if there is correlation between habitat sliders use and the pond turtles use. And we just kind of came to the conclusion based on the data that we had that there doesn't appear to be much overlap in the habitat they use. So there might be some partitioning going on. Now, there's other things that happen within the water column and everything that you can't necessarily account for. Uh, but but yeah, at least here, it seems like the pond turtles actually sort of dominate. Yesterday, I saw a pond turtle beating up on a slider. Uh, so yeah, but it's interesting for sure, but I, I would say that, you know, the way that a lot of people get into turtles uh, is a lot of them through the, the the slider world, but also I think for me, it was kind of more through the books and reading about kind of the diversity, um, and, and that's certainly one that we've heard before, but I think that, yeah, you know, the species that are really kind of unique and, and not really talked about frequently are the ones that kind of attract a lot of people as well, and maybe more of a healthy way, I guess, because, <laughs> yeah. you know, the but uh, I guess that's sort of a good gateway into, I guess, talking about sort of your specialty, Stefan, uh, and, and the, the miso Columbia. So what kind of work have you done and, and what species do you kind of focus on in, in both research, I guess, kind of predominantly research wise? What kind of stuff have you have you done? Yeah, well, um, as you already mentioned uh, in the beginning, I did my master's uh, on, on Keelitz in French Guyana. And um, yeah, I chose the twist neck turtle because it's also basically um, pet trade induced because twist neck turtles are a staple. Um, they are offered at, at reptile shops quite frequently um, in America much more than in Europe. In Europe in the last few years, I haven't seen a lot imported, but they still are. Um, but it's a it's a turtle that many people maybe know and and you know some of the collectors that want to have it all they have some in their uh, collections but uh, almost nobody really bred them or nobody breeds them on a regular basis and so I thought man um, the University of Vienna where I studied um, they have regular field courses in French Guiana because um, yeah they they do um, yeah mostly um, acoustic communication studies with uh, anurans so with um, yeah um, poison dart frogs and uh, so I could use their uh, infrastructure for for my studies and I also help them with the f frog herping. And yeah, um, parallel to that, I, I thought maybe I can get some insights how these animals live and, and maybe it, it's some help for recreating the, the necessary habitats to, to actually breed them. And that worked out quite well, I guess. And um, yeah, with mesoclemmies, with toe-headed turtles, um, I started also off with uh, some yeah, um, now they are called Mesoclemis vermuthii, but um, I, I must admit I still refer to them as raniceps because I, I have, yeah, I, I keep these since 2005, 2005, yeah. And um, yeah, that's what I called them all the time. So I'm not used to, to giving them a new name, but yeah, I got them from a close friend and uh, he said, these are turtles nobody really works with. You start your, um, at that time, I just started my, my studies in biology. And uh, he said, it's probably a good idea to, to work with these. And that's what I did. And it was a excellent idea. <laughs> so I, I keep these at home. I breed these at home. Um, I used some data from my keeping experiences for my thesis. And yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't able to work with Raniceps vermuthii in, in the field yet, but um, I found some closely related um, Mesoclemis nasuta in French Guiana. And so uh, I could get a better understanding how I should keep my toad, he toad headed um, at home, for example. So for me, it's always important to have a mix from um, taking the 
uh, experiences you make in the field, translate them to your uh, keeping and breeding um, and other way around. It's good to know the animals from uh, ex situ keeping because then you will notice differences in behavior that could actually lead you to new insights or new ways to find them uh, in the field. And also, of course, for taxonomy, it's really important that you can take your time, look at the animals closely, look how they behave, um, take a look at reproduction. And, and yeah, so this is, uh, it's closely connected for me, everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, um, for example, um, you know, toad-headed turtles, they are easily confused in the field. Yeah, um, I, at the, in the early 2000 and 2010s, I saw some field notes with descriptions of hatchlings mm -hmm. of toad-headed turtles. And the researchers said, yeah, well, we present the first hatchling of like uh, Mesoclemis giba, um from peru or what it was and then i looked at it and i said no that's not a peruvian giba that's a peruvian mesoclemis raniceps or vermuthii so i i could help out these people a little bit just by knowing what did what the hatchlings look like yeah and also nowadays we have the discussion with mesoclemis heliostema um and mesoclemis raniceps and mesoclemis vermuthii and the hatchlings look totally different so these are different species, but um, of course you can still argue which name should refer to which animal. Yeah, that's that's another question here. Yeah, so this is basically what I do um, as uh, on on the scientific side and also on the hobbyist side. Um, I, I work with mostly South American side neck turtles. Um, but I also um, have some um, Phrynops, uh, so the large ones, the large side necks from South America, and some Asian turtles. And yeah, my love and first, on, on second sight, actually, were are uh, Claudius angustatus. So the, I think in English it's uh, uh, narrow bridged musk turtles. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I never wanted to go into keeping Kinosternids that much. They were never of interest to me, but then I got my hands on a hatchling one day and yeah, from that day, it chewed its way right into my heart. So uh, now I'm breeding these as well. And it's a really fun species to work with because they, yeah, they, they can do so many different things like estivate or um, they can look into like different directions. They independently move their eyes and stuff. And yeah, there are clowns. Every time I walk in front of the aquarium, there's something going on and they follow me closely. And yeah, just a charismatic species. I want, don't want to miss working with these. Yeah. I don't know if that's already a little much of me babbling around. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a it's a good preface for kind of all the things we're gonna sort of dabble in here, or or at least some of them, uh, if, when with our times. But I guess we want to maybe take a step back to um, you. You talk about doing work with platemis uh, for your for your thesis, or I, I know that you've kind of you've published on them before with the home range. I'm just curious, kind of what you learned there. That's that's another group of turtles that's sort of within that that Kellene that's mm -hmm. sort of closely related to toad heads, but another one that's sort of not, you know, acknowledged a lot. Um, but yeah, just or sort of what did you learn about them? What are some interesting things about uh, twist neck turtles that, that you? Yeah, um, the, the most surprising thing, I think, is that I learned that they are pretty terrestrial. You know, um, you usually think of side neck turtles as basically aquatic species. Uh, people keep them in aquariums and, and uh, they are highly aquatic, of course. Um, basically, you also think of chelids uh, as animals that can only feed underwater. And then you have twist neck turtles. And um, yeah, I basically stumbled upon them right in the middle of the forest most of the time when I uh, followed them with my radio tracking device. And um, 
yeah, they, they spend a lot of time on land. They uh, don't move much when there's not any rain coming down. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that they seem to uh, somehow also to be able to um, feed on land even. Um, yeah, I was, um, I, I got an interesting email a few years ago by a German researcher who uh, made an observation where a twist neck turtle was eating uh, the tadpoles out of a foam nest of a frog species on land. And that. yeah, our theory was that maybe um, the the foam is something like loop, so the turtles can swallow it easy because usually they they use suction feeding, so they just open their mouth. Sorry, there's the camera. <laughs> they open their mouth real quick, and therefore the the food gets sucked in. Yeah? And and platamis also they prefer like small food items like rainworms and stuff like this. And um, they they don't really chew something off from from their food, and uh, yeah, that was that's very peculiar about them. So um, yeah, I have prepared some slides for uh, a talk uh, that I held at a German turtle conference a few weeks ago, and um, yeah, if you want to see them, I can show you where I found uh, the twist neck turtles there, if you like. Yeah, go ahead. Let's do it. Yeah, so sure. That'd be cool. Let's let's try the screen sharing here. Yeah, I want to do it on screen too. Yeah, these are fascinating turtles. I think that. Yeah, here we go. Cool. Ah, now you see it. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I I don't give you the the full tour basically, but um, this is where I worked. Uh, yep. So this is French Guiana in the northeast of South America. And in the middle of French Guiana, there's the Nurag Reserve. And uh, what you see here is the, the blue thing is the, the river. And uh, here is a camp where we stayed at. And the camp is only um, reachable via helicopter or with a boat. So there's no cars there. Um, no electricity or let's say no connection to electricity from from the public grid so everything is solar powered and the red lines are trails that are marked for scientists to use for their work and uh the yellow and orange areas are the the home ranges of the the twist neck turtles um, that i monitored with uh, radio telemetry equipment and um, I don't know if this is easily visible on the screen, but the darker the area is, um, the more steep the terrain is. So here in the white area, this is like a swamp. And here the dark area, this is like a small hill. And so the turtles moved from swamp up the hill. And here, this is also funny, the turtle P3 usually lived there where you have a small uh, forest stream going into the river. And at one point, it just walked a few hundred meters and walked back on one day for whichever reason. So they're really funny animals. <laughs> and yeah, so this is the, the habitat types you see there. So it's river, it's a forest uh, stream, but this is not where the animals are. This is not where, where you find twist neck turtles. Um, usually, you find them in situations like this. So this is uh, the, the researchers from the University of Vienna. They created small pools where they would study um, poison dart frogs. And the twist neck turtles, um, they used those pools because they knew that there are tadpoles in there. And then they fed on the tadpoles that the scientists would have initially used for their research, but that uh, that way I got more animals to follow around. And yeah, this was the initial setup with the duct tape. Um, I um, The problem was since uh, the, the, the research um, station is, is not easy to reach, uh, we didn't have our two component um, glue available for a few days so this was the first few days but duct tape is great um, afterwards it looked like this a little bit more professional and um, yeah after 
the the study of course everything was removed again so and um then let me show you yeah so this is how you initially find them uh when there's rain the turtles will come out doesn't matter if it's day or night uh the most important thing is that there is some form of precipitation um and then the turtles move from one pond to the next one or to they move to swampy areas because they wanna um yeah go and, and, and feed there and also they they mate in the water so that's what what they do when they're active but if there's no rainfall this is how you find them only with the radio telemetry set because if you walk through the forest and you just look at, at trees and twigs then you don't see the turtle but here this is the the dorsal growth of the of the turtle okay so they're really buried and they stay like this when when it's dry when there's no rain they stay like this for days um wait i think i have a mark yeah no i i i you know since uh gps signals in the forest are rather weak um due to disturbing to disturbance of the the closed canopy um i had to kind of use a marker to see to determine the whether the turtle had actually moved or not so um yeah usually uh, i put some duct tape there or some some sort of like a red piece of of tape or whatever and so i saw if the turtle actually moved or not and yeah this is also nice i only found the turtle because of the radio telemetry transmitter and yeah, then you have to dig it out to see if it's still there. So yeah, it, it was really interesting. Sometimes they, they were hidden for days. I'm I also noticed in, in my keeping experiences that um, they don't uh, feed too often. So it's it's really okay to feed adults once or twice per week. Um, the the smaller ones, the juveniles, they are a little bit better off if you uh, yeah feed them like once every day but only a limited amount of, of food because they will grow really fast yeah so i hope you you like that um inside and into their habitat so yeah this is the observation where they use this is these are the frogs and they build a nest made out of foam and the turtle they it, it ate the tadpoles in there and it seems like it used the foam to to make them yeah, go down their throat. Yeah. So if you want to keep twist necks, you can do it in an aquarium, but not in a large aquarium like this here. I don't know if it's visible, but there's a small twist neck turtle here. Because just because you find caimans in, in nature as well, where the twist necks are, um, it doesn't mean that they are always in the water. So you do need to have a giant land area and, and for example, at home, my land, air, or let's say the, the whole terrarium looks like this. It's a large plastic container, just like those turtle tubs you have in America. And here I have a small water basin, it's deep enough for them to mate in and of course to, to soak and everything, but the rest is basically jungle and they hide below the cork bark all the time or under plants and, and stuff like this. So. This is probably what what's working best for them. And um, a few years ago, you know, I was in French Guyana back in 2010. So um, I started telling friends of mine what the uh, what their habitat looks like. And uh, two or three of them, they really started keeping these necks like this as well. And they have pretty good breeding results with two or three clutches per year, although you know, one clutch is only like one or two eggs per clutch, usually only one one egg per clutch. So you can't really mass produce the species, but um, it works way better if you keep them terrarium style and, and not like fully aquatic. Is there a certain ratio of like males to females that you find works best or like do you keep them uh, individually or? uh to be honest i think best keeping practices are keeping them in individual um 
tanks or, or uh, terrariums because they are not aggressive towards each other, but they don't really like each other. So um, in a setup like this, I do have two females, but each female has her own water basin. So one basin is here and the other one is somewhere there. And they always are apart. And when I feed them, I have to set them up in one basin each so they don't compete for food. And since I do that, uh, both females lay eggs. Um, and I, I have tried um, a similar setup, but with only one water basis, water basin that is larger. And when I had two females in there, even though the base area is the same, yeah, it's the same type of plastic top, um, only one female would reproduce. So I guess it's a matter of dominance. And yeah, I guess you can keep a male in there as well if it's large enough. But usually, if, I, I think I, I want to reduce stress, right. and I think that they don't meet in nature that often. So I keep uh, males and females separate, and I only introduce the males to the females every once in a while, like every every few months. And but then then sometimes I introduce like two males and two females in in one top because then I try to create some competition among the males to, to ensure fertility rate. And then after two days, everybody goes separate ways again. That's awesome. That, this, looks, this is amazing. Some of the photos and, and the field work seems like incredible out there. Um, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. They're beautiful animals. I, I remember reading somewhere too that they, they've been documented with triploidy so like as opposed to two sets of homologous chromosomes you've got three like a, a an extra chromosome for each i guess chromosome <laughs> it's a three sets on, on yeah, each yeah. area so i don't know well, if, you, if there's been any I, know research. I don't know if there's been any more research with that or what if you know anything more about that uh I think there has been some recent research regarding sex chromosomes um, and, and twist necks, but um, to be honest, I'm, I'm more of a practical guy. And, and since it doesn't really affect the, the, the keeping or the ecology, at least I think so, I, I didn't really dive deep into that. And also because, you know, the University of Vienna, they, or at least the group that I worked with, um, yeah. We, we didn't really focus on that. And we also didn't take any um, blood samples or tissue samples. So I can't really say if the, the animals that I studied are, are triploid or not. So, yeah, it, it's interesting that it's only known from, from twist necks. I think no turtle species else um, has recorded triploidy, um, but yeah. It, it's also one of the peculiarities where, as, where I say it's fun to work with, with chelates in general because there's so much to learn from them and, and so much unknown that you can still find out something as compared yeah. to other animals. Yeah. I found the, the feeding mechanism like topic pretty interesting. The fact that they, they can feed on those, those foam egg masses on land well. Because you you seemed under the impression that they were using that as like a lubricant almost that they still require something they they can't just consume like the tadpoles or whatever on on their own they require like water or something to to well swallow it with yeah like yeah yeah it's you know um chelates in general their hyoid bones um are constructed in a way that they can't really move their tongue or something so um, feeding mechanism. Yeah, so so all of them do that suction feeding, and and I try to mess around with my twist necks a little bit, and and offer um, different um, types of food in water and on land, and they usually just take what they get and jump into the water and and eat it there. So I don't know if this is like uh, the observation that this is specimen fed on land is a common thing or if it's only that population or even only that that one specimen that does it i mean yeah that's that's pretty similar to uh several like aquatic species here is they'll come some of them will leave the water if and like some even snapping turtles will feed on uh goose eggs and things outside 
the shore, but they run back to the water to actually swallow them. It's not mm -hmm. like a true mm -hmm. terrestrial species, like a like box turtles, which they can feed on land and they do not require uh, any so any like water or anything. They they have the structure to swallow it on their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Incidentally, there's also a um, group of scientists at the University of Vienna. They are more the anatomy guys and not the, the ecology guys. And um, they studied um, yeah, turtle tongues and, and turtle hyoid apparatus um, to determine which one is the like evolutionary newer uh, thing. And I think they what they um, came up with is the theory that the more um, flexible the tongue is or the, the better the, abil uh, the ability to feed on land, the evolutionary newer is the, the lineage or something like this. So basically tortoises, they, they have a more um, complex feeding mechanism than, than uh, most aquatic turtles. I think that's their theory. And yeah, they, they did some super cool um, hyperspeed X-ray um, videos with Matamatas where they documented how they in, ingest their, their prey. And, and you see the fish darting into the back of the, their throat. And then, you know, they have a really uh, like three times the size of their regular size um, of their throats. And then they expel the water out of their throat and then the fish goes back and forth in the throat until all the water is gone and then the turtle starts really swallowing the fish uh, yeah i think they were somewhere online on the internet um but it's also like 10 or 12 years ago so i don't know if they're still there but there were cool videos that's interesting i think uh i mean i don't know admittedly i don't know much about this uh, species or this group but um I think they the males they also squirt water out of their nostrils as a, like an aggressive mechanism during copulation. Is that true? Yeah, I mean that's uh, yeah, probably the case in 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 many aquatic uh, turtles and also in kilids oh, right. because you know when they they uh, chew water yeah uh, to to make water go in and out of their mouth and there they kind of smell what's in the water they take up hormones or whatever they, they smell and therefore also the yeah the water can go out of their noses yeah that's it's quite common i think yeah maybe we can so now i maybe we can kind of transition into the miso clemmies uh and All get right. into that i'm just i'm getting antsy for that but uh so yes. I'm I'm curious, kind of in the process of writing your book on on toad-headed turtles, kind of what are the more interesting things you've learned about them? And maybe so, I think it's a group of uh, eleven species at this point, because there was one that was recently described. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's certain ones that I think it mentioned more than others. But in terms of like the tuberculate species, the I think the serrado perplexa, the serrado species, hogs. I think I, I, maybe Brazilian or Hoag's side neck and, and Vanderhege are all species that like most people are not going to know. So maybe you could kind of focus on those. But yeah, just overall, what are some of the more interesting things about the genus as a whole and those particular types, yeah. I guess? So yeah, when when I um, started working with Toadhead Turtles, um, I tried to gather as much literature as, as possible to learn maybe from breeding reports and, and uh, or maybe get some um, yeah, ecological data to, to improve my, my keeping conditions. And I really didn't find a lot, you know, um, for I don't know how many decades, the Peter Pritchard's book, uh, The Turtles of Venezuela, was the only real reference uh, for natural history of, of, of basically South American chelids in general. Um, and this is where I drew most information from. And I couldn't really believe, I mean, the book is as old as I am. So it's, it was written in 1984. And um, so at, at some point I just got frustrated that there's nothing around and you know, when I started following scientific publications, I noticed there's stuff published about 
Asian turtles, uh, about the large South American species, uh, about North American species, but nothing really was done with with uh, toad heads. And um, even though when I finished my um, my thesis and um, it was clear to me that I wouldn't work um, in in science because you know when I, I stopped uh, at university uh, I graduated and then I worked at a pet store for seven years and now I work as a, a technical author and and I write basically um, operation manuals but um, then I just thought okay if nobody does it then I will do it and and then I started collecting material for for the book and then yeah I, I wanted to start with only uh, yeah, Mesoclemis nasuta and Raniceps because I worked with these and I had more experience and I was confident enough that I could say, okay, I can tell something new in 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 a book about these. But then, as you said, uh, all the other toadhead turtles they are rather unknown as well. So I thought, okay, maybe let's just compile what's there um, in Pritchard's book. Not every toadhead species is. Uh, actually featured so I thought all right um, w I'll do that uh, yeah and, and then I started compiling information writing stuff and uh, it took me I don't know how long like 10 years until everything was done and the book is um, not really thick compared to how much time I spent uh, researching uh, and, and, and yeah going through literature but it's just that not that much available and I had to do it um, in addition to what I do else and yeah that was was basically the process how, how I published it and um, yeah the um, then I really you know the Amazonian toad headed they were my the first ones that I worked with and so I knew a lot about these and uh, when I wrote the book then I um, kind of recognized that hey with the South South American species not a lot is done either so uh, Van der Hege AI are the the most southern species they occur in um, Argentina southern Brazil um, in in Paraguay I was in Paraguay in 2012. Unfortunately, we didn't find any there, but at least I could get an idea what their habitat looks like. And then um, I was invited by some Brazilian researchers to do the, you know, there's these uh, species accounts from the TFTSG. The, it's um, conservation biology of, of the Kelonians or something like this. You know, it's like a lexicon of, uh, of turtle species. Different. You see, and like you click on the links, and yeah, yeah. right. And they have like everything in one account, and and we did that with Van der Hegei, and it was interesting to see when the other collaborators shared their pictures that um, the Brazilian Van der Hegei look totally different than the Paraguayan ones. So um, I didn't write a lot about it in the book because I didn't do any scientific uh, study on this so I didn't sample anything there's no DNA to confirm that but I wouldn't be surprised if um, Van der Hegei would be split up in the future because I think in Brazil there's a lot of diversity still to be dis discovered and uh, yeah the animals are referred to as Van der Hegei only because there is not something else to call them um, so that was really interesting um, when I wrote the book and yeah then I also stumbled um, across the uh, perplex toad-headed turtle or the Cerrado toad-headed turtle the Mesoclemis perplexa was only like only it's already like 15 years ago that it was described but still it's one of the more recently described species and um, it's a toad-headed turtle that doesn't occur in, in rainforest. It occurs in, in mountain streams, and that's also re really different. It's a totally different uh, ecosystem that they use. And um, when I did research for the book, then I found out that there are records of, of mountain sidenecks or whatever you want to call them uh, from mountain ranges that are 
a thousand kilometers apart, so like a, f a few hundred miles. So how do these uh, get there? So how are they related? Um, that that was also interesting. And yeah, to date there's no publication about that, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if there are either more species to be described or if more work is done that it's found out that um, Perplexa is probably spread out way more across the Brazilian east or northeast where there's not rainforest cover, but yeah, Cerrado, which is like a dry region where they only have limited water areas and stuff like this. And um, yeah, I don't know if, if you want to see these pictures, but I brought some as well because I was yeah. in Brazil in 2020, 2020, yeah, right before Corona hit. And um, it was really interesting to see that. So I'm, yeah, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. can see it. Yeah. So I was um, in Chapada Diamantina National Park. Um, it's in in Bahia, which is yeah one of the eastern Brazilian states. And this is what it looks like. There's also forest cover, but it's deciduous forest. Um, it's um, very dry from time to time you know there's it's, a it's a little grainy on my end i don't know if that's just me i just want to make sure yeah maybe if you just want to reload real quick I, it might just be a little s slow okay sorry about that yeah no 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 problem let's see what it does I have a small indicator for network connection and, it's, and it says 10 out of 10. So I don't know. Okay. Maybe it's another issue. Is uh, it better? We should, we should, uh, maybe it's just fine. try. I don't, I don't think a screen recording can get any better than that. Ah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's probably. I mean, it's grainy, but the picture will work. Like, I mean. Yeah. 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 It's, it's good. Okay. We don't need to waste time trying to figure it out. I think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what you can get from this picture is um, basically it's a hilly area there's a lot of small mountains like tabletop mountains and the there's forest but it's a really dry forest and so it's a different type of habitat from the uh yeah central amazonian species and um i hope that picture will load my computer is really old yeah so there we go yeah here in the forest it's also not like the the largest rivers it's um calm waters it's it's not flowing water and this is what where the turtles are and yeah this is what they look like so uh chapada diamantina is not uh, like an officially registered um population of of um mesoclamis perplexa but the toad heads they have there they really look uh similar um, they are more elongated there are i mean this is probably a juvenile it's not fully adult yet but uh, they don't get as large as the, uh, the amazonian ones like mesoclamis nasuta they get beasts of 30 35 centimeters uh, carapace length uh i fear you have to translate that to inches <laughs> i think no, I it's think like all, i think uh any of us who spend enough time looking at the dimensions and morphometrics of turtles can can get an idea of that but okay yeah yeah so um they are a little bit more elongated their head is not uh as broad as in other um mesoclamys so they are kind of distinct and and um here you see they have a real pointed snout not all toad head uh turtles have that oh yeah and there there's the oh, yeah, it's loading now things again oh, so wow. yeah there there are interesting and, and besides that nothing much is known about them i did some snorkeling in those streams i mean of course not in the waterfall but below and they have tons of snails there tons of uh shrimp uh i don't think that they actually catch fish but of course if fish died and they eat carrion and um yeah that's um I, I tried to give as much information as possible in the book, but unfortunately, unfortunately, this um, trip was after the book was published, because 
yeah sometimes you know you, you dig into a rabbit hole and then you go deeper and you want to know more and so it was the case when i wrote the book i said okay i want to really see how they do in nature and yeah the this trip was the result of that yeah that's fascinating as far as it's beautiful. you mentioned you see a lot of snails and things what what specifically are they feeding on like uh are they feeding on the snails and yeah, I would assume so. I mean, my toadheads, they, they go nuts for, for all kinds of aquatic snails. So apple snails are in high favor. Um, even, you know, there's these small snails in aquariums. They are very elongated. And they have a really hard shell. Sometimes they even crush these. And uh, yeah, I think crustaceans and, and snails are the main feeding items uh, for toadhead to turtles um because they are available where these are so i saw them in french guyana i saw snails and shrimp in in brazil when i was in the rio negro um, i saw them in paraguay um yeah so I, I think that's what they they eat and also you know they are kind of megacephalic, just like the yeah, american map turtles right. yeah that's map turtles do eat clams and, and snails as well so yeah do they have a this is kind of like a random question but are like the alveolar surfaces inside the mouth are they like broadened or expanded like are the, the crushing surfaces expanded inside the mouth like yeah i mean probably not as much like in diamondback turtles but uh, they still are broad enough to really get enough surface to to crush a, a shell of a snail or something like that yeah yeah it's not like cutting scissors or something that you see in sliders or in cooters but it's really like more crushing crushing area oh what yeah that's you... something i wanted to know that's really cool the a lot of the species descriptions have been based a, a lot of different things and i think it's good there's there's a lot of the head width has been used in the past to distinguish between species i think that that mm -hmm. is a pretty uh definitely subject to a lot of different i mean it, it could be allometric with age and individual variation do you think that that's a good metric for uh, you, 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 i guess you've seen a lot of them is that something that's variable within species or can you really demarcate different groups based on head width mm, yeah i think it's not easy enough to take a random specimen and compare it to another random specimen and then say oh head width is different you have to really uh compare um ontogen ontogenetical differences so you have to compare babies with babies and you have to compare adults with adults and then you see that there are differences um i also have a presentation here where you can see that so um this is a paper from 2012 i mean n8 and 14 is not a lot but you can see some differences between the different uh, toad-headed turtles here. The circles, they are Mesoclemis giba, so they have small heads, and even the babies have narrow heads, so that's, that's a different thing when you look at them as babies. And the other ones, they are definitely broad-headed, so on a, like, sub-generic um level you probably can distinguish just like with map turtles you know you have the sawback species that are narrow-headed and then you have the broad-headed species like your barbers maps turtles and or the um, perlances and stuff and then you have intermediate ones um that can go either way and with mesoclamis i think it's the same uh you have some intermediate species just like van or um, also, in in most cases, tuberculato, they don't have that really broad heads. But when you look at Nasuta, Oraniceps, Heliostema, they just have massive heads. And they already have that as a baby. So if you look at that slide here, uh, that's Nasuta. I mean, this is almost comical how, how broad the head is. And this is a hatchling Nasuta. You already see it. Yeah? Or this is a huge... This, um, I would have to lie. It's maybe a half year. Yeah, it's six months old, this animal that I took the photo of. And um, 
I don't really do anything special with their diet. So they get pellets, they get whatever you feed for a baby turtle with, and they have a massive jaw musculature here. So, yeah. And this is a picture from an animal that was um, found in nature. It also has a really wide head. So, yeah, I, I think there is something to it, um, but you can't really just randomly pick specimens. But you see the differences when you look at the animals closely. Yeah. Um, and, and when we talk about ontogeny, we also see a lot of change in color. And the color change is um, unique about the species. So, yeah, here it's Raniceps, now it's Ramuti, whatever. But these always have those four lines, two on the side. So one here and one on the other side. And they have two lines on the dorsal side of the head. So here that's a juvenile. And this is an adult. You still see at least a little bit of a line here and here. And this is what we used to call heliosderma. Um, they start off yellow, then they get pretty tan, like here, even may more gray in many cases. But when they are grown up, when they're old, they get white. So no raniceps gets white and no heliosderma gets those black stripes. Um, and that's how you can tell these apart. And um, yeah. But you only notice these differences when you are able to either catch an enormous amount of, of specimens in the wild, if you can sample babies, juveniles, adults, and old ones, or if you keep them at home for such a long time that you notice how an, indi how an individual is changing. Um, so, yeah, that's why current taxonomy of mesoclamus is a, is a mess and it's really uh, difficult to follow if you're not that into, um, into toad heads. Actually, that's um, a, a page that I, come, I copied from a field guide for Peru and it shows the difference between, yeah, vermuthi raniceps and heliostema raniceps really well. So again, you see the lines, and then um, you see the overall shell shape, which is a little bit more um, compressed. It's like more rounded than uh, heliostema, and. This is not really good visible here. They have a white tympanum, uh, the, the um, like like the ear. It's it's white in raniceps, which you also see in the original description. Wait, I'll zoom a little bit more in. Wait one more time. So this is the depiction of the um, lectotype. So this is like what the species was described after, and here it's white. Okay. Yeah. And in Heliostema, oh, well, we're still zoomed in. Well, that's a little too far. Sorry, guys. Here you see, oh, I'm too fast in clicking. Here, the tympanum is black. Yeah. Hmm. And it's just a subtle, really subtle difference, but it's fairly consistent, I would say. And yeah, it's not easy, but also here's another heliostema. This is um, what they have. And um, yeah, the, the new TFTSG uh, turtle checklist dives a little bit into the topic, but I totally understand if everybody, anybody who is not like a big fan of uh, South American keelids just shuts off and says, okay, brown turtle. <laughs> the, um, the paper, I, I asked for a paper yesterday. I think that was the one on, they actually, it, it was pretty detailed. I, I didn't expect it. I, I didn't think it was necessarily that much, but they did the, the principal component analysis to kind of collapse a, a bunch of different variables to explain that and then create that morpho space you showed. And then, so with the heliostema, they had a pretty small sample size, which makes me a little bit concerned. But, and I think that, like you said, there's been some changes to this. And then they used 
the, the it's a linear discriminant analysis and you can assign essentially based on all the samples you have to those groups that you assign in, in the morphospace space based on the PCA. And they had a hundred percent assignment rate. So it seemed like they could distinguish pretty well, but it does make me wonder the sample size, kind of how that compounds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can go back to that. Um, no, wait, go back there. Uh, you can distinguish between Giba and the other two pretty well. And I mean here, yeah, this, this is where it starts to get a little bit fuzzy. I would say, um, they do. Uh, say in the paper that they like their results, but they do um, think you should also do some genetics. And this is what I also think. So what is really desperately needed to sort out taxonomy in, in mesoclamis is that um, somebody does the work and sample all species and sample all museum specimens and then compare what occurs where, and then um, we will probably get a better picture. Because, you know, many mesoclamous species are that old in terms of uh, when they were scientifically described. We can't really use the data that they were given by the original authors. So uh, that's really a, a fun thing. Um, mesoclamous gibba, the terra typica, where you would say the animal typically is from, it's Patria Ignota, which is Latin for unknown land. So they just found it in the museum and then they, they described it as a new species. And um, with Raniceps, um, the Terra Typica is Para, which nowadays is a federal state in Brazil. But back in the days when Raniceps was described in 1855 or 1856, uh, Pará was the name for Belém, which is a city on the far east. And I don't think that raniceps with white tympanum and the black head stripes occur. So this was probably the port where the animal was originally exported from. And the guy in London who described it just said, oh, well, it's from Pará. OK, all right, I'll put it into the Terra Tupica. So, um, we have to probably rectify that if the genetics work out. If not, if, if we kind of find out that this, the population from there matches the animal, it's fine with me, then the current situation is right exactly how it is described at the moment. But to be honest, I don't think so. That is, that's pretty interesting. That, that kind of, I guess... You know, the misidentified specimens are just things that it, it really, in hindsight, is sort of an annoying for taxonomists, especially with cryptic, cryptically diverse species like mesoclimates. Oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I was curious, too, about the tuberculate toad-headed turtles. I don't know if you've got much information on them, but I that's one that you don't hear too much about. Yeah. Um, that's actually a funny thing you mentioned that because... Maybe in America and in Europe, they are unrecognized and, and nobody knows them. But in fact, this is the Instagram turtle. So if you uh, search for hashtag Cagado in, uh, in, on Instagram, so Cagado is the Brazilian name for aquatic turtle, a ton of tuberculata will show up because uh, they occur uh, in areas of Brazil where many people live. So there, uh, for example, when I was there in 2020, we stayed in uh, Salvador de Bahia, which is the um, original capital of Brazil. It was, it, it was the capital, but now obviously it's Bra Brasilia. But um, there are 4 million people living in the area and in their waterways, just like you have them in America or in Florida, um, they, they occur there and they just take pictures of a nice aquatic turtle they find and this happens to be um, tuberculata. So um, although scientifically not a lot is known and not too many people breed them, I think in America it's maybe only one or two people who really have them and in Europe it's maybe two more. But um, in, in Brazil they, they are around. Yeah, Unfortunately, you can't really 
work with them outside of their natural range because uh, as Brazilian species, they are highly protected and you can't really get your hands on some. But um, that was the reason when after I, yeah, I finished the account in the book, I started to looking uh, for some specimens in Europe. And now I have a group that consists of three different bloodlines. And my goal is to keep and breed them to to have them available in Europe for an extended period. Yeah. And they are also funny in, in terms of ecology because um, they also occur in a different uh, habitat that I would like to show you. Um, they occur in um, in a type of habitat that is called Restinga or Hestinga in, in Brazilian. My Brazilian is awful. I hope the Brazilian watchers don't uh, hate message me afterwards. <laughs> but uh, these habitats are freshwater lagoons right next to the sea. So this is the Pacific uh, Ocean here. And there are some sand dunes. And then on the other side of the sand dune, we find uh, tuberculate toad-headed turtles. And yeah, this this is really unique. So this here is uh, also one of those large lagoons. So this is not um, like meadow or something. This is marshland. All of this is filled with water. And this is where you find the turtles. or. <laughs> probably where you don't fight the turtles. Actually, you will find them here when they cross a bridge or when they cross a road. Um, wait, I think, yeah, this is also a picture from their habitat. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, these, these habitats, uh, these freshwater lagoons, they are right where many tourists are in Brazil. So um, they often uh, have to yeah, when when new hotels are built, the um, um, the habitat is gone, and of course the turtles will be gone then. And uh, they are endemic to the Rio San Francisco uh, water basin. Um, and since the Cerrado is a very dry um, habitat, um, the Rio San Francisco is drained a lot, and so there's all I think in addition even hydroelectric dams are being built there. So they they get a lot of pressure, and um, even though they are common now, uh, I could imagine that in the future they will have a hard time surviving in the wild. Yeah. So this is another habitat picture of that. And this is also one of those freshwater lagoons. So uh, the picture you saw initially with the, the ocean in the background, this is I, if I look, if for example, yeah, like if, if the ocean is in my back and I look in the other direction landwards, um, then you see this patch of water here and those white dunes. And on the other side of these white dunes, there's another marsh and this is where the turtles migrate from and, and to it's very interesting the habitat there um i guess we're sort of getting to where we want to kind of transition into the trivia but i i've got i think we've got like two more kind of quick question well maybe <laughs> i'm curious if you can expand upon the i'll be right back i just gotta go i gotta go to the bathroom real quick oh here he, he's <laughs> bathroom <fun>. break. um <laughs> Well, I'm dealing with like a sickness right now, so I have to, yeah, I have to make he, sure. I'm yeah, he's got a. Um, so I'm curious if you can expand upon the current taxonomy of, uh, I guess it would be Raniceps, and then the proposal of Wormathai, and, and kind of go into that a bit, because that's sort of an interesting thing. And then I guess after that, maybe talk about the new species, the Gerudi uh, toadhead. Those are like two separate questions. I don't want to, but yeah, the taxonomy is something that it's hard to follow and maybe not interesting for some people, but I think if we make it digestible sort of, it's something kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I think also uh, Gerutiensis was not really like, it, it, many people probably don't even know about it because it's been published so recently. Um, where do we start? So um, actually, yeah, here it's probably a good idea. So we have that discussion about uh, the difference between Heliostema and Raniceps. Um, and 
Yeah, right now the, the current situation is that we have Freenops Vermuthii, which is the name for the like Western Amazonians. Ah, wait, I have a better slide here. That's that's probably a good slide. So you have uh, Mesoclamys Vermuthii. This is the, the, the brown area. And um, we have Mesoclamys raniceps, which is the, the green area. The blue one is Mesoclamys nasuta. So we know that they are distinct and they are also biogeographically distinct because they're, this is the Guyana shield. And so uh, there's a, like a whole different ecoregion with different species occurring there. But we don't really know the delimitation um, of yeah the, the Western and the Eastern toad heads. Um, yeah, they, it's always said that they occur in sympathy but um, I got to admit, I don't really know if ever, anybody has ever found these two species in the same habitat. So they're, they probably share some areas, but not the same habitat, I would say. Um, and in addition to these two, um, there's now a third species, which is called Mesoclemis eurotiensis. And... It's supposed to be different, um, also due to the fact that Eurotiensis, they don't have an ossified bridge. And Euroti, I think it's somewhere here. I have to cheat and look on Google Maps real quick. But uh, I, I think it's somewhere here. It's somewhere in the east. I think this is probably Manaus. Um, and, and somewhere east of Manaus, there's Euroti. There's, it's a city that the species is named after. Eurotiensis. And um, yeah, uh, I do have to admit that I don't have seen any Eurotiensis in person yet because yeah, they have been uh, kept under um, yeah. Uh, like nobody really knew knew about them until they were described. I can. This is Google Maps, and here we have Manaus in the center of uh, the Amazon. So here somewhere there is Peru. This is the mouth of the Amazon, and Yuruti is there, and this is where the new species is from. Uh, I can't also really show you any pictures because, just like you said, uh, like already mentioned, um, the species is fairly new. But um, yeah, time will tell how different they really are because uh, the species description has been made solely on morphological characters. And there's not, I mean, yes, there is genetics involved, but um, I'm not a specialist in genetics, but at least to me, there were some open questions left. And so um, I would like to sh uh, share this study here where turtles were sampled along the Rio Madeira. The Rio Madeira goes from Manaus, from the center of Amazonia here to the Bolivian border. And we have two areas where they really sampled a lot. So one is near Manaus and one is near to the border. Uh, and when you look at the animals that were found, they are different. So this here are the animals from central Amazonia, from Manaus. They all have dark tympanums. Um, they are white and no stripes present. So they are either Heliostemma or Raniceps or Eurotiensis. And when you get close to the border, you see specimens with stripes and even freckles, uh, you see light tympanums like here. So these are what we would call vermuthii now. Um, and they are different, but yeah, the, the takeaway message from all of that is uh, people, sorry, are currently throwing around names, but um, at least I am not too sure which name to use at the moment. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I, I hope right. that kind of answered your question or maybe um, got some more insight for you. But um, yeah, I, I don't have the description of Eurotiensis at hand, I must admit. And uh, due to, to the fact that my book was published in 2019, of course, I, I don't even have any picture of them in there. But yeah, maybe that's something for the second edition. <laughs> All right, so yeah, unfortunately, uh, Michael had to leave early for something, and we're uh, we're about I think we're about nearing like an hour and thirty minutes. This is where we want to um, keep this episode under. So, we have one weird question um, from Greg's Turtle Haven. He wants you to explain why they are called twist neck turtles. <laughs> That's a very good question, and uh, to to make the question even better, um, in German. They are called uh, Rothals Plattschildkröte, which the, the literal translation is red necked uh, flat turtle. So I don't know why they should be uh, why they should have a red neck, and I don't know why they the neck should be twisted. So sometimes the the, the common names are just completely random. Maybe. Uh, I don't know the, the guy who who saw them first and, and gave them their common name was surprised by the fact that they turned their head around because since they're achilles um maybe the 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 german guy who named them thought that you know that the yellow color may be a remnant of uh, something that once was red you know when when specimens at the museum are stored in ethanol they tend to um have they, they get discolored and so the guy saw the yellow turtle and thought oh it maybe was red so i can only speculate on that um but yeah i really don't know for sure interesting so so their neck movement isn't like any different than other side neck turtles then. no definitely okay. not right. yeah so for mating they do head bobbing and also right. like s-shaped waving just like other keelids do but right. it's not like they twist their head upside down or something like that cool i apologize for my absence i just had to take a do a few i had to get rid of something but uh what are we what are, what are you guys on right now uh, we just uh, answered uh, names <laughs> oh okay yeah, <laughs> yeah. so i, I do you have any diagrams I, of like uh, the skull structures of some of the larger headed species i don't know this is an odd question but uh, wait, give me a second. Now I have to get up. You know, this is uh, my office and I'm kind of a book messy and, and um, I also have a collection of, of vintage turtle drawings and stuff like this. So what I can show you, I hope is visible. Um, oh yeah, are, I can see it real well. There are some old um, books where you they um, show some um, toad-headed um, skulls. I would oh, have to see. look for the reference. Um, I think it's from John Edward Gray from eighteen. I don't know how when. Um, and to. I think there should be some nice head drawings in the Peter Pritchard book from 1984 from in the Turtles of Venezuela. I don't have it at hand right now, but um, yeah, that's where you could look the, these up. So I don't have any right now in preparation or I don't have any prepared right now. But um, if you have the Turtles of Venezuela book, you can look into it and... Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's one I've been trying to get for a long time. It's just hard to find now, and it's expensive. But uh, oh. I like the – I find it so interesting how the, the lack of, like, the zygomatic arch on the those skulls, while well, compared to, like uh, – I mean, this is just – it was like a Calydra skull, for an instance, and you can kind of see. Yeah. Like, the, those processes are missing, so it's just it, – it gives the skull a completely different look without, like – yeah, yeah, right. It's it's really it's it's really wide, but there's there the, the processes are almost not visible. Yeah, they're really small. Yeah, that was one thing. That's what interested me. Oh, go I, on. I think 
I, I think I know where I have to preach at bookstore. I'll be back in 30 seconds. So, boys, don't don't take antibiotics on empty stomach. Apparently, <laughs> that's a bad thing. <laughs> Where'd Ken go? <laughs> he just ran out of the frame. We could edit this out after I just I have to apologize. I didn't find it in my hurry. Um, one more chance here. No, sorry. That's disappointing. Okay. Sorry for the bad preparation, guys. Um, oh, yeah, you're, yeah, you're good. I really like the presentation. I think the, the, visual, the visuals are going to be really good for our viewers because, you know, these are not animals that are easy to look up or understand. Yeah, I think the visuals were really, really beneficial here compared to a lot of times we're talking about more well-known or like American species. People already know what they look like, but this is, uh, these animals are completely foreign to many of our viewers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're probably foreign to, to a lot of people, even probably where they, uh, occur because they are so secretive. They probably don't see them all the time. I mean, except for tuberculata, which as I already mentioned, are pretty, dominant um, on yeah, Instagram and, and also iNaturalist. All right. Do we have any more questions or do we want to get into the trivia section? Uh, um, that's Let's that's keep the only going on question. the trivia. We just had the, the one. All right. So do um, we want to like do uh, maybe three on our side and three uh, from... Yeah, that sounds, that sounds yeah, good. Yeah, 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 we should do that. Keep it kind of short. All right. So... I guess I'll explain kind of what we do unless I don't know if Michael messaged you in advance, but uh, towards the end of each episode, we'll do like a, a, like a segment where it's typically like us versus whoever the guest is. And we try and just ask questions that have some sort of relevance, but can also be obscure and uh, kind of like stump each other, but not, I don't know. We not go too crazy with it. And like, so just so our viewers can learn something and have a little fun too. All right. Yeah, yeah. Michael mentioned something. Um, I, I hope my my questions are not too specific, but yeah, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> oh, it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Uh, I guess so. We'll come up with three questions. And I guess you can come up with three, and we'll just do okay. an alternate. Like one of us will start, and the next will go with one. It's gonna be a bit harder for us now that Michael isn't here. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be harder for us with this one, but. Let's see. Um, it's still three on one, so your chances. Yeah, we, we got good. numbers on our side. <laughs> but uh, I guess we'll just text each other's questions in the in the chat. So. Ah, so I'm supposed to to post a question or? No, no. You uh, you keep them yours to yourself, but us three will right. we'll just communicate like. We'll communicate. Uh, through that, so, okay, okay, okay. So, it's, yeah. uh, so we know what questions are, but we uh, can keep them secret till it's time to time to use them. So I'll probably stop the screen sharing because I guess we don't need it right now anymore. Yeah, right now we we wouldn't need it now. Hmm. And we'll edit this like uh yeah we edit the quiet out. parts yeah now. we do so, all right let's see so let's see i'll be right back question doesn't have to be just a yes or no question right so it can yeah, be no, right. no. Yeah. it could be it could be pretty detailed too Um, 
Okay, that's a good one, Ken. Uh, Jason, you got one? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm typing it up right now. All right, hopefully that'll do. I had to consult uh, some notes for one of my courses of which I have an exam later this week. So hopefully this will be somewhat <laughs> of a review. No, I'm a little scared. <laughs> no, you'll be all right. I, I'm, all right, uh, do you have three questions? And Because I, I think we got ours. Yep, I think I'm, I'm good. All right, do uh, you, you want one of us to start or? Yeah, I guess. All right. So I came up, this isn't, this isn't a super bad one, but it's kind of unrelated to what we talked about. Uh, which Graptomy species has the largest skull? The largest skull? Yeah. L I, like I would. I'd say like widest. Yeah. So then it's uh, uh, Barbara, I guess. Isn't it yeah. the largest anyway? Yeah. But like largest skull and body size. By yeah. Far, yeah. Too. Like, it's a significant difference. Yeah, so to precise, I would have to say females, right? Yep. Big yeah. females with like 70 millimeter plus head width, like it's up there. Yeah. I got to admit, I'm a very good, um, a very great um, Crop Demis fan. Um, and I happen yeah. to live only a few hours away from Graz, where Dr. Peter Prashak is living oh, at. Okay. That makes and sense. yeah, I, I think you might be uh, familiar with his revision of the genus. Sure. And he's a Graptemis guy for I don't know how many decades. So I was able to to see a lot of different Graptemis species, not in the wild, but at his, at his place. And it's really awesome. Yeah. So yeah. large property females are really cool. Oh, they're, they're some of my favorites. But uh... Yeah, so I get, we'll count that. You got that one. And All right. You want to hit us with one? Yeah, sure. Um, so, of course, since we talked about twist neck turtles, um, I have to ask a, a twist neck question. Um, so I said twist necks only lay one egg or maximum two eggs per clutch. These eggs, they are really, really huge. Like the female is like this, and the egg is a third of the female's body. So... Um, how does the egg get out of the body? Do you know that? Is there, oh, unless you go on YouTube on it, I was going to, I would assume it's similar to like rhinoclemmies. Is it some sort of plast like kinesis in the carapace or plastron that allows, that makes room temporarily for the egg to leave? Yeah, yeah, no. probably. It, it's basically like that. Um, and it even goes that far that uh, the bridge is connected by a ligament and the ligament yeah. expands okay. when the female is gravid. So you see actually that the female is gravid if suddenly it's Bridges higher than yeah. it was. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. But but that, that makes sense because I'd, I'd read that I'd read about that in rhinoclemmies and I, and I assumed it was a similar uh, or I thought it would be safe to infer it was a similar process that would allow yeah. that to happen. Yeah, very good. Yeah. All right. Uh, and did you want to go ahead and give yours? Yeah. All right. Sure. Um, my question is the plural Dira suborder can be traced back to which geologic time period or time periods? Oh, I'm so bad with that. Um, I, I, I don't know. I have to guess here. It's I, I will just randomly shout out a, a term that I think is passed yesterday so maybe it's like the Ju jurassic period yeah yeah jurassic yeah, and i know jurassic and cretaceous so that that's my periods i can go for it it was 50 50. <laughs> <laughs> nice um yeah, no, I I also have um, one more really specific one about um, anatomy or physiology better. Um, so I mentioned that uh, Claudius can move their eyes independently of each other. Mm -hmm. 
Do you know any more species of turtles that can do that? Any ideas, boys? <laughs> Hold up, I'm thinking. I'm, um... I was about yeah. to say chameleons and realized that wasn't a turtle. <laughs> yeah, close, good. close. Uh, I can give oh. you a hint, though, if you like. If you give us a hint, that might that yeah. might help. So you guys are um, in connection with the turtle room, and there's a guy of the turtle room that has some googly turtles. Is it Geomida? Yeah, right. So Spangler Eye can also focus on this eye and go to the other side with this eye. I, feel, yeah, cause I was like, oh, you're probably talking about Anthony, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, the, the Geomida. That's yeah, actually really uh, interesting. I think that our viewers are really going to like that. So. Well, one yeah, it's question. not like a chameleon, like completely different, but you yeah, see that you focus somewhere else. <laughs> right on. Uh, so our last one, uh, what extinct fish clade likely led to modern tetrapods? What extinct fish? Like a uh, group or clade likely led to modern tetrapods. <sighs> now I have to Google the German name Quastenflosser. Uh, 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 Silacanthus. Is this the? I hope it's the uh, correct English name. Wait. Let's see if the English one. Yeah, Kellacanth is. Yeah, I don't know if uh, this is. Do I, I believe it's it right? uh, the rip. Ripidistia, some uh they're both sarcopter ridgii, so like you're, you're kind of on the same track of it's so like the ah, okay, fish yeah. is like so you were you were close, but I mean or maybe it is I don't know. If if, if I'm wrong, you, you know you can blame it on Dr. No, 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 I, 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 since he taught me it, but I'm quite sure you're yeah. probably more correct than I am. I, it was just I'm just firing out. Yeah. What I thought could be correct, but my gotcha. pale paleontological horizon is Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> I think like the new uh, Jurassic World Dominion is coming out this summer. So, oh yeah, I'm looking forward to, look that, forward yeah. to that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so, I have a six-year-old son, and I'm thinking if I can take him, but uh, I guess my wife won't allow it. <laughs> is uh, all right. Yeah, you got your last question. Yes, I, I have one. It, yeah, it's probably easy, but yeah, you know, I'm from Austria, from from Middle Europe, and we don't have a very high diversity in, in colonians, but um, we do have one species, and it actually occurs in Vienna. So, um, do you know the name of that species that we have in Austria? Is it the? Uh, oh, one you guys got it, or you want me to? I think I've got it down to the genus, but I, I don't I don't know like what species is, uh, it would the, be. Is it the European pond turtle, Emmys orbicularis? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, we um, one of our neighboring countries. They have testudos as well. They they have um, tortoises, but yeah, we only have that aquatic one. Right. So yeah. That just about wraps it up here. Um, thanks for coming on. I know that it's been like almost an hour and a half, so we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to yeah, come think, talk to. I think we had a really brutal nerds. A really beneficial discussion today. That's a a very unlike a, a like obscure group of turtles that a lot of people that a lot of our viewers are not going to know much about, and uh, even us, a lot of us are not as well versed on them as we should be, but. Uh, yeah, that was it was a really good conversation. So thank you for coming on and uh yeah, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it was fun doing that. I'm I'm old. I had never did something like this before and I kind of like it, I must say. Yeah. Yeah, we um, great. Yeah. It's been uh it's just been gaining momentum every time. I'm, I just get every week we do one of these and it's, it just gets even better, so. Yeah, nice. So yeah, um have a lot of success with that. Um uh, I hope you have some interesting guests in the future and I'll definitely be watching. Awesome. And uh, is your, I don't, I actually don't have your book yet, which I really need. Now that I saw this, I'm like, now that we had this conversation, I'm like, wow, I really, I really need to. Yeah, where can that. people find it? Yeah. 
Um, I think there's one or two sellers in America that have it because um, it was um, published by Chimera. Wait, there is it. It's a German specialized. Yeah, uh, it, it's a specialized book um, publishing company and bookstore. So you can order it from Chim Chimera internationally, or from American dealers. Or I can also. I have a few of these at home and. I'm happy to sell, um, sign them or, or dedicate them to you. Um, I just have to, you know, I have the regular postage rate. So shipping to America is probably $25 only for shipping. But maybe if, uh, I don't know, like two or three people at the same time want the book, we can ship them there to one point and then you distribute it on, on your own because then you can save some on shipping, I guess. So, yeah. Or... Whoever is interested, um, message me on, on Instagram, for example. And if you're in Austria, you can have some coffee at my place or, or a beer or two, and then you'll get the book as well. No problem. Awesome. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll link your social media to all this, too. Yeah, um, thanks, guys. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably direct message you after this because I'm, I'm interested in getting the book. So. Yeah, sure. No, we can work something out, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Well, so I guess we'll end the recording. So yeah, great. Thanks for coming on. It was uh, Thanks, guys. it was great. You know, seeing seeing all these turtles, I I learned a lot. I this is a group of turtles I know nothing about, so I was very very glad to see this. Um, that said, this episode is concluded. I'm going to end the recording, and there you go.